The following is a recording of a presentation I gave at NOFA New York's Winter Conference uh, for the 2017 season. It was entitled, Does CSA Make Sense Today? One Experienced Farmer's Bullish Perspective. I actually forgot to record the first third or so, so that's what this part of the recording is, and then I will continue with uh, what I recorded live during that talk. So here we go. Overview of Sisters Hill Farm. Sisters Hill Farm is a CSA in the Hudson Valley of New York. It was established in 1999. The farm is owned by the Sisters of Char Charity in, of New York, and they hired me that year to start the farm for them. Nowadays, we're growing on five acres and we grow vegetables organically for this CSA. We grow 90 to 100,000 pounds each year. Our, average year. our average yield for the past three years has been 93,000 pounds. We have 300 members, shareholders, and we grow for a 24 week growing season. If they renew their share for the next season, they get a Thanksgiving bonus share right before Thanksgiving, which makes it a 25 week season. And I would like to mention that um, we don't solicit outside funds to run the farm. So the shareholder um, payments for their shares uh, cover the operating expenses of the farm, including my salary, apprentice salaries, um, all, our, all of our equipment, all of our tractors, any infrastructure we've improved or developed on the farm, all those things are covered by farm expenses and have been since the second or third year. We had a tractor loan the very first year, or the second year rather, that we paid off over a series of years with a 0% loan, those kinds of things. But since about the second or third year, we've been uh, self-supporting. So what makes Sisters Hill Farm unique? We sell only CSA shares. We uh, sell at no other markets. We give about 10% of what we grow to charity. We have a sliding scale, so people can pay within a range of about $100, and it's totally up to them where they pay. But we say, if you pay toward the upper end of the range, you allow the farm to meet its operating expenses while allowing those with more limited resources to participate. We have only one 24-week season, no shorter options, and no winter growing. We have only one share size, and it's picked up at the farm weekly or bi-weekly. 80% of our shares are picked up at the farm. The additional 20% we drive down to the Bronx and we deliver them there, and that is uh, where most of the Sisters of Charity are based. So we decided when we began that we wanted to make sure we had a drop-off site down there. Our average member has been with us for six years, and member retention on any given year is right around 80%. So what's the state of CSAs now? Uh, the general consensus among CSA farmers is that prospects are becoming bleak. Their worries include competition, increased competition from boxed meal services, um, other CSAs in the marketplace, the explosion of new farms, so there's many more small local farms than there were 10 years ago. Fewer people cook and customers can be fickle and demanding. So let's look first at meal kit company retention. Um, a lot of people are worried about them as a source of competition. One year customer retention rates for Blue Apron, which is the leader in the marketplace in terms of meal kits. Um, after one year, they only have retained 18% of those original customers. Hello Fresh and Plated are even worse with 10 and 6%. According to member assembler data of 305 CSA farms around the nation, the average member retention rate for CSAs one year is 46.1%. So one year after they joined, the next year only 46.1% of them join again. Let's contrast that with Sisters Hill Farm. So in order to get to a 46% retention rate, we have to go back eight or nine years. So this is the number of members that started out um, in 2008, we had 207 members. Of those 207 members that began the 2008 season with us, 101 of them are still members today. So not just the next year, but today. And then if we look back to our very first year, 1999, 17 years in the past, we still have retained 23% uh, of those original 40 members. So <clears throat> that's 23% that is still better than um, Blue Apron's uh, retention after one year and it would about equal their retention after about eight months. So how do most farmers respond to these changes in the marketplace? 
Well, one thing farmers have done for a very long time is try to diversify the market streams so they don't put all their eggs in one basket. So they find other sales outlets behind CSA. In addition, in their CSA operation, they try to be much more customer centric, offering more choice and more options. Maybe they would deliver to more locations so members have to travel less far to get their produce. Perhaps they might deliver to members' homes. Um, they might actually box up shares for customers rather than have it, uh, you know, market style. Uh, they might have customer share sizes, in other words, a small share, a personal share, a large share. They might offer shorter multiple seasons, a spring season, a summer season, a fall season, a winter season. And they might have custom box content where you can order all the items in your box and get exactly what you want. Oh. All right, thanks. <laughs> So Greg McKeown, author of Essentialism, The Disciplined Pursuit of Less, he describes that <clears throat> we have a finite amount of energy that we're able to devote to things in our lives and projects and things we want to accomplish. And if we really focus on our energy on, first of all, deciding what we want to, what is most important to us and saying no to the multiple opportunities available to us that are not those most important things, we can devote a large amount of energy <coughs> and really make significant progress. The alternative to that is not really deciding what's most important to you and making a millimeter of progress in a million directions, is something he describes. So it's a really excellent book. One of the things I wanted to sort of get out of this talk was just to lead you towards other people who say this much more eloquently than me. So write down some of these resources and, and look them up if you really become interested in it after listening to me today. So I'm just gonna butcher what their message is, but hopefully I get you at least interested in their message. So I cut my teeth on a farm that shared that strategy. It was a typically diversified market farm. It had 25 acres of organic vegetables, and they sold through CSA. They had, welcome. Yeah, no problem, glad you want to sit up front. Uh, they sold through multiple um, outlets, like I said, CSA shares. They had custom order boxes, uh, sold to grocery stores, sold to health food stores, sold to restaurants, had wholesale accounts. And when I was working with this farmer, um, I saw that it really wasn't the model for me. Um, he, part of the reason I decided to get into farming is because I really wanted to be outside. I wanted to be working with my hands. I wanted to be working directly with the plants and the soil and other people that sort of shared this vision. Um, and he was in the office all the time. You know, everything was about, you know, that next sale and trying to sell what was coming up and what was ready, which makes a lot of sense, certainly. But it wasn't the life that I saw for myself. Um, also, there was a number of issues throughout the season that I saw that, you know, you put a lot of effort towards something and then it might not work out. Like, we picked $18,000 worth of blueberries for a wholesale account in Boston. It got trucked up there. They took a core temperature of the pallet. It was too warm. They rejected the load. It never got back to us. You know, so it was an $18,000 loss. And he thought, well, you know, let's put a lot of energy into the blueberries this year. Let's get people out there picking. And then you lose all this money because you're not really set up to work effectively in that direction. Um, another example was on our survey at the end of the year, somebody said, you know, I was really upset about the fact that you were kind of cherry picking better stuff for other markets, which is something I've heard a lot over the years of CSAs that sell at markets and, and also sell CSA shares. And, and uh, I went to that health food store and it, what they had said was the leaks were so much nicer at the health food store. I went there and they were just had mislabeled them. They were someone else's farm. They just left the label up from this farm. And so they weren't even his leaks. And yet there was this dissatisfaction coming from a member and they were less happy with their share because they perceived that there was a slight there even though he was above board with everything. So there were a number of examples that, that said to me like, this is not what I want out of farming, you know? So, so books and farming mentors led me to an alternative vision. So after working on this 25 acre farm with a huge diversity of markets, I was hired by the sisters. All we want to do is CSA. We want to give stuff to charity too and we really want to be ecological about the way we're farming the ground. So that was exciting to me. And also I was going down to one acre, which was like, to start anyway, which was like I could do the very best job I possibly could, put all my effort in one direction, kind of like that essentialism thing. So for me, a couple of books that were important, The Pathfinder, um, this is a book about finding and choosing a career for a lifetime of satisfaction and success. <laughs> And one essential part of this book was what must, it was a question you should ask yourself. 
what must be a component of my future career. So for me, it was I wanted to be outside. I wanted to be working with my hands. I wanted to be, I was an environmentalist in school, and I really wanted to be working toward that. Um, I wanted to be um, mentoring people who were really excited about this, all those things. And then The Seven Habits of Highly Effective People is a really, really great book. Um, old and dated now, but I read it every couple years and I'm still inspired by everything he has to say. Part of it is beginning with the end in mind. So you look at your life from the point of your funeral, you know, and you say, what do I want people in my professional life to have said about me? What do I want people in my family, you know, all those things. And you look at all the different roles in your life and it's a way to sort of create balance and to look forward and be pro proactive and all these things. Elliot Coleman's books were very helpful to me because he really had a vision and he really um, planned quite well to make sure that what he was doing, all the effort he was putting towards something was um, gonna come to fruition. Linda Hildebrand of Food Bank Farm. Um, this was a CSA and all they did was CSA and gave food to a food bank. And then uh, Paul and Sandy Arnold were great mentors of mine and basically all they did was farmer's markets and they were really good at that, so. So why simplify your marketing strategy? So you may say, okay, Dave, this all makes sense, but I don't feel like I could sell enough CSA shares, so I really wanna you know, keep all my eggs in different baskets. I don't wanna put all my eggs in one basket here. And uh, I'm gonna share some psychological issues with you guys that I'm sure I will mess this up really bad too. But again, go to the source. You know, If you become interested in this, go to the source, try to understand a little better. But one of the things that got me thinking about this was like I said, we don't have any choice during the season, but, um, and we don't have like different options for people to feel bad about that they chose one option over another. But for our thanks, we have a Thanksgiving bonus share and whoever signs up right away at the end of the season, while they're excited about all the shares they got, all, all the boxes they got all season, um, they get a, a bonus pickup right before Thanksgiving. And what we do is we harvest everything that's left in the field and we just divide it amongst all the members who signed up. So if you're a weekly shareholder, you get a certain amount. And if you're a bi-weekly shareholder, in this, on this particular pickup, you get half, half the amount of the weekly shareholders. And it's still a lot of food. Pardon me for a sec. But <clears throat> in this particular uh, case, we went and we harvested the turnips out in the field and they had beautiful tops. So we bunched them instead of topping them. And once we counted up all the members that had renewed, we realized we only had enough bunches for our weekly folks. So that particular item, we said, weekly folks, one bunch, bi-weekly, none. But we upped a whole bunch of other quantities. You know, they had many more potatoes for the bi-weekly folks than half, many more than half for carrots, many more half other things. So overall, it was, they got a much better deal than half of the weekly <coughs> folks. You know, we tried to even it out. So a couple days later after this uh, bonus share, a woman called me up and said, you know, I'm, I was really upset that you didn't give me turnips. And I explained the situation, you know, this is all we had. And, and she said, I want my money back. And I was like, this was your bonus share. <laughs> you were satisfied with, you got, with what you got all season long. You know, and so you could say, she is just crazy. You know, this is just a crazy woman. Forget, it. put it out of your mind. You know, maybe be upset for a day, but then. But this, you know, it's sort of these people at the fringe that sometimes sort of open your mind to what's going on in other people's minds, maybe to a lesser extent, you know, to your more psychologically sane members. Um, so, I mean, I think a lot of us are just like, these, you know, customers are fickle, people are crazy. But one of the keys to effective marketing and being a successful entrepreneur is empathy and kind of getting inside the head of your customers, you know. And so, when something really goes wrong and somebody is, is brave enough to tell me that they were unhappy with it, I really listened to that very closely. So it got me thinking about this. So there's a TED Talk. How am I doing on time? Good. There's a TED Talk by a guy named Dan Gilbert. He's a Harvard happiness researcher. He's the author of a book called Stumbling on Happiness. And some of this was just so interesting. It may not be entirely relevant, but I just want to share it with you. So. If somebody wins the lottery and somebody breaks their back and becomes a paraplegic, who would you predict a year later would be happier? Paraplegic. <laughs> well, yeah, some people are very counterintuitive, but essentially their level of happiness did not change. 
So the people that became paraplegics, the people that became lottery winners, one year later, you know, their pre-event happiness and their post-event happiness, they reported the same levels, okay? And we would expect that the lottery winner would be happier, but that's called an impact bias. Um, we believe that circumstances make us happy, but in reality, with very few exceptions, three months after a major life event, there's no change in our level of personal happiness. So in his talk, which you should listen to because he's way better than I am at this, uh, he mentions that we have a psychological immune system. We can synthesize happiness. And he describes it this way. Natural happiness is a feeling we get because we get what we want. So you put together the ultimate share for each member and they're just so happy because they got exactly what they wanted. Synthetic happiness is when we're happy regardless of what we get. So you put together a share and there's a bunch of turnips in there and they hate turnips, you know, but they still are happy. They're still really excited about your farm. So freedom to choose is the friend of natural happiness. And I think that's what most of us remember when we're like, let's do a whole bunch of things, you know, let's have all these options. But freedom to choose is the enemy of synthetic happiness. And synthetic happiness is part of what we're trying to create in a way. So synthetic happiness works best when we are totally stuck. So the way um, Dan described this, what's that his name, Dan Gilbert? The way Dan described this was, you're on a date with a guy and he picks his nose, you're not going on another date with that guy. <laughs> but your husband picks his nose, well, he's a great father, he gives great back rubs, he's a, he's a loving <laughs> husband, you know. So you see past that, you overlook that. So you're stuck with your husband unless you, or your wife, unless you decide, hey, you know, the emotional bank account is so empty that, you know, we're going to get a divorce. So, so you overlook those small things. Okay, so this is the whole idea behind synthetic and natural happiness. So my customers are stuck with one share size, weekly or biweekly. There's no alternative for them to see or covet or feel remorse about. So if you have a farmer's market where you're selling and you have a CSA share pickup right there and they got their CSA box and it has red mustard in it, some of the lowest crops, that you know, celeriac, things at the bottom of the list in terms of preference. And the market at the stand, you've got spinach and you've got lettuce and you've got tomatoes and they didn't get those things and they paid 25 or $30 for the box that week. Now they're going to say, wait a minute, I had this option right there in front of me. Why am I buying this stupid box? You know, I could have had exactly what I wanted. And the same is true with different share sizes, the smaller share size. So I never chose to do a small share size and a large share size because invariably what I had seen looking at other CSA farms is everybody chooses the small size. And then the farmer bulks up the size of everything and you end up losing money. You know, you're giving out more produce in the small size. You don't have the large size anymore. Nobody's paying for that. And so we, we avoided all that. We avoided all those psychological ills that happen when you give that choice. So the whole buzzword in CSA now is give them choice, but you gotta give them choice in the right areas. Does that make sense? I hope it doesn't, getting some good nods. Good, good, all right. So well, my advice is don't offer choice on items that are universally loved. Offer choice on similar items like greens, you know, if you've got a whole bunch of different greens, kale and collards and Swiss chard and whatnot. And then they can choose their favorite amongst those. Um, also offer choice on things that are at the bottom of the preference list. So you've got, you know, your red mustard, your Swiss chard, your celeriac. Some people love those things, but a lot of people hate them. So yeah. And then if you're given a box, they're stuck with what that box is too. So that's another, out we're going to talk about that. But. So this is Barry Schwartz, another great TED talk I listened to. Whenever you're choosing one thing, you're not choosing others. And those things have attractive features. And that's going to make what you've chosen less attractive. So there's always this opportunity cost. Every time you, every time you choose to do something, you could have been doing something else, you know? And so that's another, you know, sort of related to the box. So again, get back to Sister Sale Farm a little bit here. Uh, beginning with the end in mind, you know, something I learned from Stephen Covey's book. So what do I want my life, what do, what do I want my life to be like? What do I want farming to do for me? So what I wanted was a balanced life uh, with time for family and other interests. 
And because I'm growing just for CSA, I can grow very efficiently, and I can make a reasonable profit, and I can have time for these other pursuits in my life. Like, I only work 45 hours a week all season long, and then in the, in the winter, quite a bit less. Um, I built my own home, as you see there, um, cleared the woods and um, designed it myself, built it myself. You know, I hired somebody to do the foundation and somebody to do the drywall, everything else I did. Um, you know, I have a lot of time with my wife and my kids. I have a cabinet shop in my basement where I build all kinds of things. I built all the trim in my house and do custom built-ins and design tools for the farm. Really enjoy that. I have an exercise room in the basement. I participate in lots of sporting activities, love competing, all those kinds of things. So I want um, my life to be about more than just farming. I want to be successful with what I'm doing as a farmer, and I want to feel really good about that and the sense of community I've created and everything else. But I also have other interests outside of it, and I want the farm to serve those things and not for me to be a servant to the farm. So by really focusing my energy on CSA only, I've been able to do that. So. Um, I wanted to work outside with my hands, I wanted to create community, feel a sense of connection with those that I feed. I never felt like it needed to be some big huge thing that I could, um, you know, sell, you know, beyond my local community really. Um, I feel like the way that I can become something larger is to sort of share with other people so that they can increase this vision and sort of have, find the same happiness and success that I have. Um, I wanted my work task to be creatively challenging, but not crushing. You know, I really love a challenge. I really love having something that I need to make better, you know, improve a bottleneck at the farm. But I didn't want it to be so much that I was overwhelmed. And then I wanted to mentor others in a field that I love. So how does CSA, how does being a CSA only grower work to fulfill my life goals? Everything's sold in advance, and I can't emphasize this enough. I'm never off the farm. I'm always out in the field focusing on growing the best produce I can and mentoring future farmers. So the only pickups we have, we have a Saturday pickup and we have a Tuesday pickup. We have the Tuesday pickup in both places. Uh, one of my apprentices drives the van full of produce down for those 60 shares in the Bronx. And um, we have a pickup at the farm at the same exact time. And then we have a pickup at the farm only on Saturday morning too. So. Those are the only times we are doing anything around delivery and there's only one person going to deliver something. And our farm pickup, <coughs> it's um, market style and we're there constantly repacking so everything looks bountiful and beautiful and they never feel this sense of loss that they didn't, they got less choice or something by coming a little later, so. Those three are at a farm picnic. That's why they're in such nice garb. <laughs> they do look nice though, don't they? <clears throat> so what about competition? The concept of niche. So uh, I was an environmental <laughs> studies major in college. Um, I specialized in ecosystems. One of my professors is sitting right there <laughs> enjoying this talk, which is pretty awesome. Um, but what I learned about was the concept of a niche. And in ecology, every organism has its own specific role to play. And they have their own feeding habits and like all these birds have different size and shape beaks and head shapes to navigate crushing different size seeds or whatever it may be. And so the best way to look at your business and your role as an entrepreneur is to find an appropriate niche given what you want to accomplish. And so a good example is Southwest Airlines. Um, if you were to invest money in one company in the S&P 500 back in the 70s, you'd make the most money if you invested in Southwest Airlines. And one of the reasons is that their CEO has really focused on being customer centric and thinking, what does the customer want? And he's created a low cost airline based upon these principles of efficiency and direct flights and not offering meals and all these things that were really contrary to what everybody else in the industry was doing. And they were trying to be more universally appealing and he was trying to be directly appealing to the customers that were appropriate for his market niche. And subsequently, he you know, had the highest profits because he wasn't looking to please everybody. And I think that's what a lot of us are looking to do. I was talking to a young woman in the audience just before coming here, and uh, she was saying, I do deliveries because I feel that's what people want. And the people that really want that, I don't really want them as customers. 
<laughs> I want customers that can really buy in and feel like we are working together toward a common goal. So my goal as their grower is to help them improve their lives and their health. And our goal together is to improve the community and to improve um, uh, access to food to people of all income ranges and to help grow farmers and all these things. So we share in these, these visions and it's a win-win vision. And the other important part of that win-win is win-win or no deal. So if somebody doesn't share that vision with me or I don't feel they're going too long term, I don't want them as a member. I don't feel bad about not taking advantage of every potential member out there. I want the members that are going to stick around long term because they share that vision. Or we can get somebody excited about it, maybe a little, and then we can really get them in whole hog by sharing our vision with them regularly. So hope that makes some sense. That's kind of rambly. But. So Sisters Hill Farm niche, here's our vision. To grow healthy food which nurtures bodies, spirits, communities, and the earth. So it's about more than just food, a lot more than just vegetables. We share our mission with them. And how do we do that? Um, one of the primary ways is through our newsletter. So we actually have a paper newsletter that we print out every week. And you know we started long ago, so we stuck with what we were doing. A lot of people nowadays just do email. It's too expensive to do paper, you know? Or it's not environmentally conscious to do paper. What I find is members pick it up right then and there and start reading it as they're picking up their vegetables and then they want to discuss things and they're just really engaged with that. And if they have that paper, they, go, they get home and they unpack it and it's in their bag and they start putting things in, the groceries, in, the, in their fridge and they read that newsletter and then they really connect with what we're trying to share with them. So through our newsletter, <clears throat> not only do we have recipes that are focused on what we gave that week, but we also share with them, like I said, how successful our apprentices have been or what we're trying to teach our apprentices. Um, we share with them about how, we, how many meals we share with other people through our charitable giving, all these, all these things. So they, they really get a sense of what the farm is all about and they get connected to that and feel good about that. So again, to mention that, that idea of a psychological bank account or a relationship kind of a bank account is we're making deposits in that bank account every time that we make a connection with them. And every time they feel a slight, we're making a withdrawal from that bank account. And so if that bank account's really high, you can have a crop failure or something that doesn't work out quite so well. And there's still a lot of positive um, thoughts about your farm. So. so environmental ethics, sharing healthy food with people of all walks of life, mentoring other farmers. And the farm is very neat. Um, we keep it really neat. And that adds to our sense of professionalism. Like we feel really great about the job we're doing every day when we go out into the fields to work. We're like, this is, this is looking good. We're on top of things. We don't feel you know, drained and behind. And, and part of that, like I said, is, is being out in the field every day and not being on deliveries and going to market for a 15 hour day and then being exhausted the next day. Um, and then members really get excited about that. I can't tell you how many times I've been like, members have come to the farm and been you know, I like just how the tractors are all parked in a nice line there and you know you really seem to take care of things or um, so many people say when I drive into the driveway I just feel this incredible sense of peace and tranquility and it's like this is the way life should be you know and I'm out there picking with my friends and family and I think it's something that they're really longing in their lives like everything else is so go 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 and we're focused on ourselves and we're focused on what we need to accomplish and all of a sudden we get in this environment where people are out picking flowers with their kids and picking their own stuff and they feel that um, they feel that sense of tranquility and peace and like this is the way the world should be and you know part of that is like grass mowed short <laughs> it's just sort of something that's hopping in, in my head right now but as organic farmers we're like well you know ecology and weeds and everything else but if you're walking out into the field and, and the grass is tall and your shoes are sopping wet, you're not going to have quite as nice a time as if the grass is a little bit short and you walk out there and you pick your own and things are well maintained. And so, you know, you, you got to sort of get in your customer's mind too and, and try to really make that experience as choreographed as you can. Um, maybe I'm getting a little off topic here. So. <laughs> but anyway, the presentation, the whole, it's about the whole experience. So the presentation of the vegetables also is really beautiful and there's always a sense of bounty. So um, Dan Kaplan, he's a CSA farmer in uh, Brookfield, Massachusetts. He's been doing it for, I don't know, eight years longer than I have and I've been doing it for 
18 years now. But he had an excellent Farmer to Farmer podcast with Chris Blanchard, and he talked about this uh, concept of shared risk. It binds the consumer and producer into a unit. They become collaborators and not competitors. And he believes that the controlled experience of loss is something that consumers are actually searching for. And so, you know, there's a caveat with this that I'll talk about later, but he said, he talked about the times that they had incredible storms that wiped out crops and that the membership really came together about that. And that most people in their lives, you know, you order something from Amazon, it better come in two days and it better be exactly what you wanted. You know, you expect everything perfect. You know, you go into the grocery store, everything's gonna be perfect. But what they're looking for in a CSA is really that connection and that understanding that, you know, we do live in a finite world and there are limits to what we can produce and weather is real, you know, and, and things can become affected, you know. So uh, he really feels like that's an important part of what adds to the value of his, his membership. And I would add that our shared, vi that shared vision and rewards, uh, excuse me, uh, shared vision and shared rewards is also something they're searching for, obviously, not just the risk. <laughs> and he, he doesn't just say it's that, but. So it's not to say you don't have to be an expert first, okay? He says, I have no mercy whatsoever for farmers who don't figure out how to succeed and then cry about it. Um, if you don't meet the marketplace where they are and create a product they both value and can afford, then as an entrepreneur, you have a problem and you have to fix it. So I, I totally agree with him there. So now I think we're going to get into the nitty gritty. So how do you maximize your members' natural happiness? So we're not talking about the synthetic happiness when a couple things go wrong and they're still happy because they're really committed. So membership surveys guide our planning decisions. <coughs> Once a year, online, in the last couple of weeks of the season, we put out a survey. So it happens while everything's fresh in their mind. We usually do it right after distribution's end. And uh, the reason we do it then is because like, maybe you have some celeriac, you weren't given it until right then. You know, it might have been nice to have the data a little bit earlier. But there are some crops like parsnips and celeriac and things that are just late season things you really wait for it to be cool to give out. And so um, you ask them the big questions first, then you move on to smaller and more specific questions. So here's our survey. We do it on Google something or other, Google, I don't know, Google forms. forms, Google Forms. And it's, it's really great. We used to do a paper survey and it was just so much data entry that you didn't feel like doing it. It'd be like a week of putting little numbers and spreadsheets but so first we ask quantity so thinking about the quantity provided in your share this week please indicate your satisfaction with the amount and that's what our results look like that's what you want them to look like <coughs> three is just right and you got a nice uh, bell curve there with 13 percent or 13 11 percent of people saying it's a slightly too little and 13% saying it's slightly too much and nobody really at the extremes. <coughs> Quality, this is the absolute most important thing. Um, on a scale of one to five, where one was poor quality and five means excellent quality, we've always had a 4.9 all our years, which is something I'm very proud of. And I think this is the key. Like if the quality's not there, forget it. You'll never have good member retention. So you need to make sure that when you're getting your survey back, um, they really perceive it to be high quality. And I know of other, I know of a CSA near me where I'll walk their fields and I'll say, this is, they're growing better food than I am. But when, when I've seen their shares, it doesn't look like better quality, that's for sure. So a lot of it is about harvest and post-harvest handling and things. So how carefully you handle leaves when you're bunching, you know, whether you remove seed leaves, all these kinds of things, how clean you get the roots. So quality, uh, uh, in large part, is not necessarily about how vibrant and turgid those leaves were in the field, but what they ultimately look like when you get to the customer. So I've spent a good amount of effort sort of streamlining and making our harvest and wash pack sort of system very efficient, which leads then to this, um, you know, quote unquote, perception of quality, even though we do feel we grow quality food too, we care for the soil and everything else. But it's all about the way, what they think about it, not what you think about it, and how good it looked in the field. It's when it gets to their, in their hand, so. <coughs> Variety. 
So now focusing on the variety, did you give too little or too much? So again, 83% um, of people said it was just right. Uh, about 10% of people said it was a little bit too little on variety and 5% a little bit too much. But these are important things to ask. doesn't really matter what my results are. And then lastly, thinking about the overall value of the share, please rate how you thought they valued it. One means low value and five means it was an excellent value. So those are really important things to ask. Um, another thing that I've heard from people is I don't get any survey results back. You know, I got three back or something. When I send this out to customers, I make sure that I tell them explicitly in my email, and even when I talk with them, I say, we make our crop planning decisions based upon what you tell us. So this is your farm, and we want to make it better for you. We want to make it a better experience. So if you fill this out, you're enhancing the quality of your share next year, and we really want your information. So we, we get about 115, 130 responses. So we get some really good firm data here. Out of how many that you asked? Out of like about 280 or you know 300 this past year, yeah. <clears throat> so now onto the question about specific crops. What are their favorites? So lastly, please indicate how much you and your others in your household enjoy each of the following types of produce, where one means the least enjoyable vegetable and five means a household favorite. So the great thing about this Google Sheets is that it can give you these graphs, which is really nice to see that visual representation as you're planning, uh, planning your crop plan for the next year, and then also planning on what to put in the box and what to choice and what not to choice. So if you look at turnips there versus tomatoes right to its left, tomatoes is clearly a more universally loved crop. So I, I, one of the ways I interpret that is when I'm putting tomatoes in a box, I'm not worried about whether I'm putting it in too many weeks in a row. I know that, generally speaking, people love tomatoes. If I'm putting turnips in a box, I'll think very closely about whether I'm, I've been giving it too much lately, you know, and how much is too much. And again, this is one of the wonderful things about market style versus actually boxing your shares. And it's a little bit of an aside here, but it's one of the reasons why I really advocate pick up at the farm. So if you have pickup at the farm or, or bulk distribution, like Roxbury Farm still, after all these years, does bulk distribution, where they bring enough for everybody at that site to pick their own as well and, and pack their share. So an important thing about the way we present our shares is when we put up our share board, we have quite large shares, really large shares, but we say, take up to two heads of lettuce, two pounds of carrots, five pounds of tomatoes, whatever it may be. And we explain to them at their first pickup when they first become members, if it's too much for you and you know your family's not going to use it, we certainly encourage you to try it. But if, if it's building up in your fridge and you don't use these things, leave it. We're going to give it to somebody in need. So again, you're removing that amount of regret that might have been there. And if you're not really keyed in with them and you haven't really built a relationship with them and they don't take those things and they figure you're just going to sell it elsewhere, then there starts to be all these bad feelings about it. You know, so there's all that potential for a, a psychological issue when if, you, if, you, if you're giving stuff to charity or you have that strong relationship, they're not going to feel bad about leaving stuff back. And then they won't have that remorse of things rotting in their fridge. So what time is this supposed to be done? 10, 15? Yeah. Okay. We're doing good. We've got a huge break afterwards, so you can go long. Oh, good. I'm not going to go long, but we're, we're going good. I'm going to leave a lot of time for questions because I hope there'll be questions. You guys seem pretty engaged, so I'm excited. Um, so, did you grow and distribute the appropriate amounts to please them? So this is also the second half of the, this important, these two things work dynamically together. So thinking about your share this season, please indicate your satisfaction with the amount of each type of produce you received. So in this case, the, um, um, I can't even tell what color that is from here. Yellow? Brown? What's that middle color? <laughs> Tall one. Mustard. The mustard, the yellow brown color there um, in the middle, that's what you want, just right amount. So all those things look like we did a reasonable job. But you can see that beans, um, that a number of people thought somewhat too little, and broccoli, a number of people thought somewhat too little. So it's really important to know, you know, first of all, how much do they love that thing? And then how much would they have liked more or less of that thing? And that's how you plan your, your crop for the following year. Yes. Do you, do you do those for all the different crops or? Yes. Yeah. Yep. Every crop. This is just a, I just took a screenshot going through all that 
stuff on the Google Sheets. <coughs> Here are all the crops. I keep getting questions right before the slide pops up. That's great. <laughs> I love it. I anticipated your needs. <laughs> Which is, again, empathy, you know. And, and um, this is another aside, but I think we have time. So when I think about all like the significant positive improvements that have come in my life, they've all been when I decided to put the effort into an effective presentation. And that's the essence of marketing, is to kind of figure out how you can kind of get in somebody else's head and <clears throat> understand their needs, you know, so listen first, you know, seek first so that you can then understand, seek first to understand, then to be understood. Um, and then, you know, sort of answer all those needs as well as you can. So like, when I started working with the sisters, I was having a really great time working for them. The farm was very successful and I was looking for farmland elsewhere. And I had this idea, you know, I've created this sense of community. I have all these people that are such an important part of my life now. <clears throat> Things are going pretty well here, but I do want to own my own farm. I do want to be right on the farm. So I asked the sisters to sell me land, you know, and I made this effective presentation. And I said, look, you know, here is how, um, how what I've done, how I built this farm for you, and here's, you know, your general nonprofit CSA and the turnover rate and the ineffectiveness and the, you know, they're not making money, they're not making ends meet. You know, will you do this for me? Will you sell me land so that I can have a house, you know, right adjacent to the farm here and, and have my family be here? And, and that worked out, you know, and, and there's a number of examples like that. So I kind of looked at the person I was trying to negotiate with or the situation as it was, and I came up with a solution anticipating their needs or trying to understand their needs first and then addressing those. So that's what this is all about, essentially. Um, so then we got all the different crops, the quantities, and, uh, and then you have all your favorites. So we take these two things in conjunction and we figure out what we want to grow more of, what we want to grow less of, and it's really nice to have these graphs. And then the other wonderful thing about these graphs is inside our barn, we have <coughs> a big spreadsheet on the wall and we write down what we gave each week, both A week and B week and Saturday and Tuesday, which are our pickup days. And we can look back and we can say, oop, it seems like the B week people have gotten potatoes, you know, two or three times in a row and we didn't give them to A week people. We're, we're missing out on that. Let's get that balanced out again. So, and then these as well help us determine, like we can quickly look, we're trying to figure out how we should give out that share that morning. We can look and say, oh, look, turnips are, look at the graph on turnips. Maybe we should choice turnips this week, not just say take a bunch of turnips. Let's choice turnips with red mustard or something or rutabaga or whatever it may be. So these graphs sort of help us make those informed decisions rather than just, oh, we have a lot of Swiss chard. Let's give bunches of Swiss chard, which is, Swiss chard is one of the lowest crops, which is amazing. <coughs> Yet as farmers, we love it. You, know, <laughs> you can grow it all season long and it's beautiful and you keep pulling off leaves. And it's like, yes, let's just keep giving Swiss chard. Well, you may be losing members because of that. So. <laughs> so let's look a little more closely at a specific crop. This is my son, John, who's now 6'1 and 13 years old. <laughs> but uh, he was probably uh, 18 months there. He liked his broccoli. He loves vegetables. <laughs> I bring home a bag of carrots for the root cellar. He's like, I'll eat them all right then. I'm like, John, <laughs> let the rest of us eat, please. <laughs> the 13-year-old appetite is pretty unbelievable. <laughs> So here's another way of looking at the survey data. So this is broccoli, and you can see that, um, I can't see so well from here, quantities. So broccoli was the thing that particular year, I don't know what year this data is from, but they wanted broccoli, they wanted more broccoli than any other crop that we, on our survey anyway, they wanted more of it. And then in terms of favorites, I can't get, oh, that's not the pointer, here we go. Uh, broccoli's right there. So it's, it's one of the top, you know, 10 crops there. And this doesn't mean like they won it a million times more. It's just that's where I started the graph. Um, so anyway, the next question to ask is how did broccoli do this year? Because just because you didn't give enough, maybe it was a horrible year. So all of a sudden you go five times as much broccoli and then you have just way too much broccoli. Or again, there's an opportunity cost to everything. So you grow more broccoli, you have to grow less of something else or have a whole lot more work on your hands or whatever it may be. So it's all a balancing act. 
So was it just a bad year? Um, what's my historical average? Should I plan based upon a poor year, an average year, an excellent year? All important questions to ask. Then we look at our crop records. And uh, this just reminds me that if you don't have records, how can you know what kind of job you've done? And how can you know if you're making any improvement? You know, so we've weighed everything we've ever harvested on the farm since the very beginning. And you know, we're at like 1,300,000 pounds or something. For some of you big farmers, that might be nothing. But for me, I'm kind of psyched about being over a million. For a while, I thought I might retire at a million, but do something different. But still having fun, so maybe it'll be two million. Um, so we look at the crop records, and we see how this year's yield compares to other yields. So for broccoli, here's six years of data. So those taller, you know, around 2,100 pounds maybe there, those were good years when everything went well. And we had a really bad wet year with poor yields of broccoli. And then we had a poor spring growth followed by great fall. So that 2011 year, that's interesting. So, you know, um, Dan Kaplan talked about shared loss. That was just broccoli. The wonderful thing about CSA is that that was really a great year for all kinds of other greens. It was just that we had some bead rot or whatever it may have been on broccoli. But the diversity of a CSA really is part of what creates the resilience. And, uh, you know, we may have a crop, we may have like one year, maybe it was 2011, but we had a real blight issue on the tomatoes and our normal yield is 10,000, you know, somewhere between eight and 12,000 pounds of tomatoes. And that year we had 2,000 pounds of tomatoes. And, uh, you know, tomatoes are a very important crop, but because it was a wet year, we had a great year with lettuces and all kinds of other things, all kinds of greens. Um, but the membership really came together to help us out on that. And they really understood that and they helped prune those tomatoes back and try to save what we could. And so again, that shared risk, I think, improved the situation in terms of our relationship with our customers. Yeah. Do your interns have responsibility for helping put out the survey and then analyzing it? Or do you do most of this data uh, analysis? Most of this happens, yeah, they're usually gone um, after that last pickup. But I share this with them. I mean, it's part of what I try to teach them. Um, yeah. And the data analysis really is, I mean, it used to be a lot more time consuming to, to do all that. And now I just have these graphs and you just have to, how do you interpret them? So. so now we have the information we need to start planning. We begin by looking at our total available ground and our cropping regimen. And uh, how much land is available? Will we leave any ground fallow or cover crop? Will we double crop, triple crop? Are there rotational issues that will come into play that will limit our cropping choices? So we, we don't do any double cropping on the farm. Yes? In any of this, I don't see the economics behind it. Like, you don't take into consideration what was the profit margin no, no, and um, of individual crops, certainly not. I mean, of the farm as a whole, yes. We want to be a sustainable farm. And then, then a lot of people do look at a farm like mine and say, well, it's a nonprofit. There must be tons of money behind it. But um, I've always run the farm so that the proceeds from our sales support the farm, including my salary, all the apprentice stipends, any additions we make to the farm infrastructure, all the tractors that we own and things have all been paid for out of shareholder funds. So it is a sustainable farm. I mean, I think it's a great example of sort of a family scale farm that works, you know, and can be quite efficient. Um, so I'm not sure if that's what you meant or if you meant individual vegetables. Because some people look at vegetables and they say, this vegetable economically does not make sense. I'm not making, I'm going to reduce the, we don't do that. CSA to me is about broadening people's um, <clears throat> exposure to healthy food, which is going to create a healthier diet for them. I look at it as a whole package. And we are certainly making enough money that I, I can have a really nice salary and the farm works well. So for me, I don't care as much about making an extra $20,000 this year and getting rid of the top eight or getting rid of the bottom eight crops because that would be less of a win for my members, you know? So I look at it more holistically. Um, so how much land is available? Will we leave any ground fallow? All those things. Uh, here's how much ground we have. There's all the different fields on the farm, the square footage associated with them. So we have 209 beds basically available to us. A bed for us is we use a five foot system, five foot uh, width bed, about a four foot top. Um, so center to center is five feet and they're 200 feet long. 
couple fields that are 400, couple fields that are 100, but we consider a bed, a 200 foot bed. So we have 209 beds, 4.8 acres available. This is our overview page of our crop plan. I learned all this from Dan Kaplan in 1998 at a NOFA summer conference. It's just simple Excel spreadsheets. And here's broccoli. So these are all the things. The very first year I actually like crunched all these numbers and cared about what the average yield was and the distribution per week and the number of weeks we intended to give it. After that first and second year, I never really looked at that stuff again. What I looked at was what did we do last year and do members want more or less and, and can I fix it and fit it in, you know, based on what we have available. So I could describe all this. Let's see, how are we doing on time? I'm not going to though. Everybody, does everybody kind of, you can see what's going on there, or figure it out or talk to Dan Kaplan. <laughs> but the basic point of this is um, the, be, the, the plan for the year prior, the plan for the year upcoming, and then what is our intention based upon those other two criteria that we looked at, the quantities and the favorites and how, how happy they were with what we gave in the past. Okay, the rest of it is all just math. And I don't even look at the math that much anymore because of those, those are the decisions I care about now. But when you're first beginning, that's really important. You know, you say, okay, I wanna have carrots for you know, 10 weeks out of the season is what I'm gonna base my you know, plan on or whatever it may be. And I'm gonna give a pound and a half of carrots each time or something. So that all this math will, will help you figure those things out. So you can look at the total cropping area and adjust your, adjust your quantities. So again, nice thing about working with spreadsheets first instead of just out in the field is you can plant your 2016 plan. You can look at the number of beds, 202. Great. That works out good. You know, what did we do last year? We had um, 195. So we went up a little bit in beds. Um, it's not going to be that much more work. You know, you got to think about in the case of broccoli, sure, members would like a whole lot more broccoli, but broccoli takes up a good amount of ground for the amount of yield that, that it gives you. And for us, it is something that can be quite variable, as you saw from those graphs. So I'm not, even though they want a good bit more broccoli, I'm going to take that into account, but I'm also going to take into account the, again, that opportunity cost of choosing that over something else. So I look at the whole package and I say, eh, maybe we'll up broccoli a little bit, or maybe we won't even based on that. But if I choose to ignore what the members have told me, not ignore, but if I choose to, to not do exactly what they would have preferred, I tell them why. You know, so that's an important part of it. On our survey, if somebody says year after year, I want Brussels sprouts, why aren't you growing Brussels sprouts? Why aren't you growing sweet potatoes? I make sure I'll tell them in a newsletter, we suck at those crops, you know? <laughs> I've never been good at sweet potatoes. I've, never, I've tried it so many years, you know? And the uh, cucumber beetle larva burrow into them in these big deep holes and we don't use any black plastic on the farm. So, you know, that would have helped them, but we don't do that and we care more about these other issues. So it's all about, again, that relationship. You had a question? That was that was your question. Great. See, I keep anticipating. I love it. I love it. Great example. Okay. So now you start to assign dates to those successions. <clears throat> so let's see. What are we looking there? Broccoli. So in the case of broccoli, um, we grow it just spring and just fall. So we're not fighting with the summer stress, heat stress and everything else and getting little tiny heads. So we do two successions, uh, a couple weeks apart or something in the spring, a couple weeks in the fall. And we grow four beds for the first succession, three beds for the next, four beds and four beds. Most crops are just planted at regular intervals. So carrots, we might decide that we want to grow whatever that is, eight or nine beds of carrots. And we can just uh, figure out the earliest ground date that's appropriate and then just add two weeks and use control D to kind of populate those cells with those dates and see if that works out with the final date there. <coughs> Next, you insert your flat dates and your soil prep dates and you come up with uh, greenhouse schedules and soil prep schedules and those kinds of things. So this is probably all just kind of not that, you guys know all this stuff, but I think the basic part of it was just the, uh, the way that I come to figure out how much of each thing to do. But. So for our flat dates, it's about three to four weeks for most crops, depending on cell size and everything else. And then the soil prep date, again, is about three to four weeks in most cases. Um, we'll start preparing soil about three to four weeks in advance of when we put it in. 
Obviously, if it's a tiny seed like carrots and you need excellent tilth with no trash, you know, you might do it a month or ever so slightly more than a month ahead of time to try to make sure that you've got a good seed bed. If you're doing big old tomato transplants, you could maybe till it up the week before. So, And what we're really aiming to do here is maximize the growth of our cover crop in advance of that crop. So we really don't want to work it up until the absolute last minute. So we'll choose blocks uh, within fields that we will work up maybe just five beds because we look at those dates based on that plan and figure that's an appropriate area and we can wait a little longer for the rest of the field. So then you sort by ground date and flat date to get those plans like I mentioned. And now you can start inserting varieties, um, figuring out your rotation and creating field maps. So our basic rotational categories is starting to get into a whole other talk, but those are, those are them. <coughs> Pick out your seeds and create your field maps. So again, we look at the crop maps for the past three years of cropping history. We try to identify major pest and disease issues that you're trying to avoid. We create a plan that resolves or eliminates issues while allowing maximum benefit to the cover crop from the cover crop. We plan our field layout around workflow and efficiency. For instance, we plant spring and fall greens in blocks of five beds because that's the width of our reme. Um, our reme is 30 foot wide by the 200 foot. And that's what ends up being the most efficient if we try to plant in those blocks. And we create cover cropped harvest lanes for really heavy items like melons and eggplants so we can throw them and we can take the tractor down that harvest lane with the, a bulk bin and the loader and throw them to somebody central and it's a lot faster and easier to... So we create efficiencies as part of our plan. And finally, we fill in the maps, carefully consider past cropping history. And those are, that's a little map of all the different fields on the farm. And we create a ground prep schedule. Again, sort of covered this a little bit. Um, we look at similar dates within a field. Like I said, so we can work up fairly large areas. And the larger robust <laughs> transplants, I mentioned that. Direct seeded crops um, need a better seed bed. Then you print it all out, put it in a binder, and it guides your entire season. So one of the nice things is I don't, like if you ask me when we first plant whatever, I have no idea. I'm really good at principles. I'm not good at remembering specific things. So having this whole plan here, I can sit down every Monday morning with my apprentices and we can look at that plan and everything we need to seed that week in the greenhouse, everything we need to seed that week in the field, all the areas of field we need to start preparing, and we're on top of it. And we know what needs to be accomplished that week. We can plan around the weather and different variables. Yeah, Wes. So I, I wanted to go back to the, the season plan and <coughs> your succession dates. Have you had to adjust the standard plan? I mean, you're always dealing with weather and conditions, but it seems like the last six years yeah. have been pretty, at least where I am, have been pain. <coughs> so have you adjusted that like with an insurance planting or anything like that, or you just stick to your... No, I don't. Um, in that first initial crop, um, planning spreadsheet, the overview, that page, there is a 20% fudge factor based upon those past yields. So, you know, it would theoretically increase what you intend to be growing over, what, by 20%. Um, and that was sort of like the standard that I started with that Dan Kaplan recommended. Mm -hmm. Again, now I really don't look at that anymore. Um, my approach has been to just try to be better and better at dealing with the variety of weather that's been, you know, coming at us nowadays. So get do a better job at irrigation. But basically, we have such robust shares and we are able to really focus our efforts on growing things well that a lot of things, knock on wood, you know, tend to work out in an, any given year, you know. So we don't specifically, because everything you plant, everything you decide to put in that field, you have to care for, you know, and all of a sudden caring for that might distract from another thing. And so we've got it really down to a exact science in terms of getting all the work done we need to get done in the amount of time we need to get it. And we don't want to put something out there like just in case as an insurance thing. So yeah. How many apprentices and staff people do you have? I'm the only year round staff and then I generally have three apprentices a year. For a number of years I had the pretty much the same share size, about two hundred and thirty full share equivalents with only two. 
And I was really proud of that. But again, the weather got so crazy and everything else that I was planting, you know, multiple plantings because something might have gone wrong. And just for um, the joy of it and, and actually sharing my methods with more people and sort of creating that. I guess that's my best insurance policy, Wes, is really just having a little bit extra labor so it's not that much more stressful to sort of redo things when something goes wrong. But um, so now we've gone with three and I'm happier with that for sure. Yeah. Are you going to be talking about labor more later? Nope, we're just about done. Okay. <laughs> so you can, can ask can me you perhaps. Talk about labor a little bit, like what's a day like on your farm hour wise? Let me just finish this up and then I will talk about that. Okay. So the take home message. CSAs can still thrive in today's marketplace. I hope, I hope you feel that way now. Um, plan your farm based upon your life goals and your personality. I can't emphasize this enough. Like if you love having a million things that you're juggling at once, then by all means, you know, have a, have a multiplicity of markets, you know. Um, but you need to sort of examine what you want out of this, I think is the real way to start. Empathize with your customers and put yourself in their shoes and think win-win and win-win or no deal. And don't worry about missing every, every, you no, know, don't, don't worry about engaging with every customer out there. You know, figure out who, who you're going to focus on. Uh, choice is good, but too much choice can overwhelm people and cause decision paralysis and regret. And our lives are short and time is more precious than money. So narrow down the possibilities in life. Say no to something so you can choose to make progress in the directions that matter most to you. So this is a guy who came to the farm. His name is Peter Christman. He's 85 years old. He came to the farm the very first year. We had a little article in the newspaper. He wanted to figure out what it was all about. And he saw me out there picking rocks with a wheelbarrow, grubbing through the soil, trying to prep beds. We just had a BCS that year. It was me working all alone. He saw all these big piles of rocks and he immediately sort of felt a connection and felt like, wow, this is something I want to contribute to. And he has been a volunteer ever since. He's come to the farm for all 18 years. He's picked about a million pounds of rocks out of our fields all by himself. <laughs> he, um, he knows that a five gallon bucket when heaped full weighs about 65 pounds. So he keeps track of it in a log. <laughs> he takes the tractor down on his own early in the morning into a specific field and sets it next to the field and puts out 20 or 30 buckets and grubs in the soil and, and digs them out. Nowadays, he's digging out stones much smaller than I care about. <laughs> but it's unbelievable. You never know where a relationship is going to lead. This guy, you know, if, if weeds get behind me in a certain area, he'll, he'll clear it up and make it look beautiful. I mean, the farm is his farm as much it is, as it is mine, you know. And I think that's really what CSA is all about. And I think if you're just, you know, if you just want a little money early in the season, I think you're going about it all wrong. Um, did so he wear down that grub hoe on the right? He did, and he's worn down multiple. He's worn them down so the uh, leftmost side of it's like completely gone. I, I tend to nowadays to be a little less cheap and buy them earlier for him. You know, <laughs> he's like, I'm going to need another one. You know, but this this is a very robust Johnny's tool, and he grubs. Yeah, you know, so I thought that'd be a cool picture, but. <laughs> He wants, to, he wants to drop dead in the field. You know, he, he loves this so much. He was an IBM executive, hated his job as a manager, you know, retired years, ago, years and years ago. But um, he found his second calling here. And he's not very social. He just loves working in the, you know, we have parties and things and we celebrate all our volunteers and he doesn't come to that. We, we go out for beers with him and his wife, you know, to, to celebrate his contribution each year. But he pays his membership in full. He doesn't want to doesn't want to feel like you know he owes anything but it's unbelievable what we owe to him so I think um, you know this is really exciting for me I mean I thought many years about should I go off and start my own farm you know but these kind of connections and you know this year I had back surgery I was out for you know a month or so and you know while I was out people came out to help the farm there's one young woman she'd been a member since she was three years old you know her parents joined 16 years ago or 18 17 years ago and She's in college now and summer vacation. She helped for several weeks. And like that kind of, you know, people feeling like they're that invested in the farm is something that you don't get very many other places in life. And, um, you know, my family and I, we're not the most outgoing people, but it's amazing the sense of community that we feel around all this. So, What's his name? This guy? Peter Crispin. Yeah. So thanks. Hope you learned something. <laughs> Uh, 
All right, questions.